Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Uh, I ask y'all to overlook uh, the structure today, but there's a little change of pace, if it's all right. One of the things that I want to talk about uh, today is uh, something this we was passing the other day. And this is about uh, black gangs. Uh, so the article on the FBI, right? Yeah, actually, I found the article on uh, New York Times, actually, from uh, Would you just read the, the top part of it, the first? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, this one's from New York Times, but it says pretty much the same thing. In a personnel shakeup that reflects the end of the Cold War, the Federal Bureau of Investigation plans to reassign several hundred agents from internal security investigations to combat serious crime and gang violence, uh, officials in the Bush administration said today. Although the move is expected to involve uh, fewer than 300, uh, yeah, involve fewer than 300 agents in a force of about 10,000, the shift is symbolically dramatic and representing a downgrading of counter espionage efforts in favor of a more intensive attack on violent crime, particularly gang violence. Call it a peace dividend, one official said. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, just visualize the big, gigantic, mean Soviet Union. If you could think back to the uh, during the 80s and what have you, they had TV programs where the U.S. was taken over by the Soviet Union and all of that stuff. And, and they have movies now, Wolverines, what, either the Korean, somebody taking over the U.S. But something that's not funny is, number one, you have the the Soviet Union in its breakup, and they reassigned 300 FBI agents to what? To black gangs. What I want to talk to you about is my experience with this issue, and not the common what up, running up and down the street uh, experience. Uh, I'll just start by last. The last time I was in Iran, uh, they was pressing me about black gangs and, uh, you know, I know where it's coming from. It was coming from Mujahid Abdul Karim, the Shia Imam, and Masjid Rasul in L.A. That's been his flag thing for a thousand years. And I would tell him all the time, because he would be talking that stuff to the Iranians when he would go to Iran. This is during the revolution, not during the revolution, but during the Jepai, during the war. When you, you wouldn't believe that the, the, the oxygen, if you almost, you could feel it in Iran. If you just light a match, you could feel it would almost catch fire. I mean, that's how juiced up people was. We'd have them programs, and Jahid would, he would speak, and then I would speak, and he would be telling the people that there are thousands of people, black gangs in the United States, waiting for Imam Khomeini to give the word to rise up and the people would be ecstatic. And I would be telling the brothers, that nigga's lying, tell him to stop. I mean, we, we right here on the stage. And I would be looking at him, I'd say, tell him. I would be like, Mujahi, shut up, you're lying. It's a damn lie. It ain't two niggas in America waiting on no message from Imam Khomeini. But that's Mujahid's line. And, of course, he, to me, he's a tattletale. He's always been from Jump Street. I, from, I'm not going to go off on it, but since they sent Shia snitches to 
Oakland and Berkeley right away in the early part of in 82, 83, 82 and 83, right away. The, they, they came from Baitul Deen. I don't know if you ever heard of Baitul Deen. Baitul Deen was in Blanco, Texas. Blanco, Texas, they had a shake down there called Fadullah Haim. He had a, a big compound and he taught Islam and he was technically from Iraq. And technically he was a Shia, but I asked the Negro, a whole group of Negroes transferred to Oakland. And they was, uh, they was always ready a group. It, against us, when somebody came, they was a group. They didn't send no one or two every night. In. They had wonderful children that could recite Quran and everything in those days. That's a big deal, 82, 83 and all that. Oh, they could just. And so their goal was to divide up, to pull us away from the Shias that we were going around talking at, at all the places now, by then. They did it in, 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 uh, in Denver. You know, they tried to, uh, I was walking down the street in the morning in Denver, not walking down the street, I was doing my regular run. And then the guy had been in the penitentiary we had one year Meet him, yeah, he used to come to all the Muslim meetings, yeah, da, 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 da. Uh, I'll get back to the story in a minute. But anyway, uh, yeah, what you doing with it? I said, no, man, we got to join over here, come on by. That Negro came by and joined in with the group of wonderful Sufis, Sunni, Shias, every Arabs, everybody. And then, when I would go back to Oakland, there's a crew there that would try to destroy what we did then. And so, I don't know if you heard of Sheikh Jelani them. Sheikh Jelani them had a crew up in Denver, like they had some going down to LA too. The crew in Denver, you might have read around Denver, Colorado, just think Colorado. You would read about them in the newspapers every now and then. Uh, the brother that was really pushing unity between Negroes and Iranians, he's got his name on a big building now in Iran, right now. That's how important he was. He was important then. He's the same brother that had a little contract. You know, since he was a hustler, he had a little contract with Radio Shack. He would get stuff, you know what I mean, and let brothers go to the uh, flea market. If that was flea market, yeah, whatever those markets are. When I left, they tried to undermine what we was doing. And, and one of the brothers told me, yeah, man, Najib, uh, when I went to his house, I saw these blonde hairs all on him, this white girl. He did this a nigga back as I am, with the blonde hairs on him. You know, and then they was just filling me in on stuff. And a group of brothers from Carolina came to Denver when I was back in California. And they was working with Ali Kolgi, and he gave them $8,000 worth of material, and they run off with it. So that no Iranians would trust blacks anymore. You see what I mean? The other thing they tried to do was try to cause disunity between us and Iranians. The lucky thing was that the Berkeley crew had the sharpest, one of the sharpest brothers. He was my best friend. He still is today. Right? Uh, and they made sure that uh, there was no division. On May 30th, 1982, I gave a lecture in L.A. We don't want Iranianism. We don't want Pakistaniism, we don't want Arabism, 
All we want is Islam. Mujahid and his Iranian friend, Ahmed, down there, told me this is what uh, government agents say. We don't want Iranianism and all of that. What I was telling them was, you guys got a good thing, your culture. All we want in America is Islam. This is the time when we're establishing our identity. We don't want, because the people give you pack, the Pakistani culture wrapped in Islam. And for them, it's all Islam. And, and they have a right to do that, because they don't know the difference. They, they just, that's the way they got Islam, wrapped in a Pakistani package. Iranians got the same thing. They got this is Islam. It's wrapped in an Iranian package. They can't see it, but we can. I say, hey man, we don't want that. I remember the date. It was March, it was April, May, May the 30th, 1982. The biggest demonstration we had, Quds demonstration in LA was in 1984. And it was the police was walking down the street on Wilshire Boulevard, 8 deep. One, two, three, five, you know what I mean? And then on the other street over here, you can see the police going and coming. On the other street over here, you know, going parallel to us, is the other police. They had us boxed in. The Negroes that came from Baytuddin, Father Lahiri in Blanco, Texas, and the Negroes in LA was a clique. They tried to start a fight with the police so the police could come in and beat us upside the head. So we all sat down, which was perfect, and they was they, they out of pocket, they up there trying to kick at the police and everything. In other words, this stuff that we see and smell from time to time, we don't know what it is. Let's jump to the last time I was in Iran, then I'll go back to where I was. The last time I was in Iran, on press TV, you know, you know, if I'm in Iran, that's all I'm going to watch because I don't don't speak Farsi, because I'm not going to. I may look at a few more channels just to see what's going on, but I'm going to be at press TV over and over and over again. And oh, that cycle, they must have kept it on an extra week or two, but they showed the confiscation of drugs on the Afghan border, and Iran is a, a miracle country because of the, the, they try to send drugs to, to Iran to Europe, right? And you talk about drug confiscation, man, and they be collecting all kind, not only opium, not only heroin, crystal meth, and all that from Afghanistan. Not too much of a stay in Iran, although there is a small drug problem in Iran, no doubt about it. Of course, they just, uh, they just get killed, that's all. They just get killed. No, from 89, I, when I came in January 89, when I left in mid-year, they had already, they started a new policy. Anything over an ounce of uh, drugs, you're gonna get hung. They had hung 500 people by the time I left. You get due process, you get all of that, but you're going to get hung right away. And so that's the law. The death penalty is all throughout that, that part of the world. In Indonesia, you get caught. You remember white folks get caught during the Reagan administration with the Haram. Please don't kill them. And they said, well, you want to kill all the niggas? And in California, why you don't want, to, want us to lynch these uh, crackers over here, you know. But anyway, so there's a line that's gone. 
the Iranians in the foreign ministry keep hitting at me about black gangs in America. Black gang, this is Mujahid's line for 40 years, 50 years. That's his line. It's bull crap. It's bull crap. It ain't gonna work. Although people that watch movies like, uh, what was it? What was the movie? It's based in Chicago. 72 spooks set by the door and all that stuff. Right. Yeah, they got it. The black gangs gonna do everything. I'm gonna get back to real black gangs in just a minute so we understand when we're looking at something, what we're looking at. Anyway, so they keep telling me, you, you think they're trying to convince me, like the guy came here two weeks ago trying to convince me of what, uh, uh, you know, whatever they want to convince me. I said, no, that ain't the way it is. So I'm talking to the brothers, I'm saying, no, man. So, of course, I didn't say this, but I overheard somebody tell them, what the drugs you're getting? If you want to bust up America, you want to bust up America. This is, I didn't say that. certain things are haram, but I don't know how when you get in a big war and people are trying to kill you and all, I don't understand all that. I'm just playing with that. Because I didn't say this. I said, you want to bust up America, here's how you do it. I didn't say this, this is I'm here, this is the guy sitting there. He says, if you want to bust up America, you want to degrade, that's at the same time, portrayals, Senate generals, Girl, white girls, they secretaries, you know what I mean. Right. General Patrol, all of them. So you want to bust boss man up? So you target the Pecklewoods. You target them just like they target niggas. You target them. Put all the excess money that you get from drugs. That's so don't worry about drugs being traced back to Iran. You get them into Mexico. Just don't worry about you get them into Mexico. And from Mexico, 20, 30 miles from the border, by, you know, Rancho, this, that, now they got two, three thousand miles, you can buy, right? And you use them across the border. You use them across the border. So, but these drugs are targeted, especially cocaine and other drugs. You can corrupt the hierarchy. You can corrupt them. Easy. Pretty girls, white ones, black ones, all kind, don't make no difference. And cocaine, it's a deadly mix. It's a deadly mix. And if you got enough money, you can get enough girls on your team. Keep them high as a kite. Manageable. You can't just be high folding out, but I mean, and eyes red and work and all that. But they're strategically placed. I said, you'll knock the big boys. You want to get them? You go after them. No. You've got to go after them. You can't be playing. You go after them crackers like they've been after niggas. You go after them systematically, diligently, right? and you bust their ass wide open. You can't lose. You, you can't. When you, you target them weak-minded peck of woods, General so-and-so, and he'd been married to his wife 500 years, and she old and wrinkled, and here's a tender right here, right? Ain't nothing he can do. He can't, because they don't have Tuskegee Bill Nafs. They don't have none of them. They don't have it. They don't, just don't have it. You know, I'm not saying I knew anything about America, but a guy I'm listening to, I was listening to that nigga, like, he sounded like he knew what he was talking about. So, said, but black gangs? Now, they were showing me that to almost, you know, the drugs and the drugs, to trap me into a certain type of thing. That's what they was doing it for. 
right? Because they knew I was there. I know the people in press TV. I know they know me. Everybody knows that, and I could see what they're doing. But I flipped it on them, or it was flipped on them to tell them, if you're in a war with America and you want to bust him up, go ahead. That's the way you do it. Don't waste no time with no black gangs. Do not waste any time with black gangs. You can't do it. Boss man ain't going to let you do it. And anybody, and I was telling them, if Mujahid is telling you this SHIT, you're crazy. But if you want to bust up boss man in a war situation, that's, that's him right there. That's him. So he's trying to flood your country with uh, heroin. That's what he's trying to do. So if you want to bust up boss man, you get him easy. And you, you don't have to, you know, it's manip manipulatory after a while, right? You're not destroying people's work. Just one little shift here, right? I want to generally just give you a little information, right? And you still get money in cocaine, you still get the white lady or the Mexican. Or you have kind of freakish, which they are anyway. You can just choose what you like, right? You know, and it ain't no big deal. And then by that time, they don't care. You know what I mean? They like the high, and they like the other. You make niggas out of them. Yes, you just make niggas out of them. They make niggas out of us, right? So on. We know how. They know how to make niggas. We do too. So you just ride them boys, and you just stay on them, take your time, no hurry. Pretty soon, you got them all the way up to the White House. You don't have to worry, you just take your time. They all do it, it ain't no problem, right? No, and that's what somebody was telling them. You want to, because they're showing the amount of drugs that Iran confiscated every day and they a big truckload and they prevent them from going into Europe and they don't even give Iran no money for it. Right? They're preventing, I mean, if without Iran, Europe would be the dope capital. Well, it's kind of headed that way anyway. But it would be really, I mean, Afghan heroin is so pure, it's just Afghan black tar. 